Hi, this is 1010 The Navigator, and I am reading the Anunnaki Final Warning to Earth and their return in 2022, the fifth edition, by Maximilien de Lafayette, starting on page 161. The children finished eating, still in complete silence. Each child, as he or she finished his or her meal, leaned back into the chair, and as soon as all of them were leaning back, the groove from which the plates came opened up and reabsorbed all the plates. They now go to an automatic dishwashing machine, explained Sinhar Inanna Shamara. The children got up and left the dismissal room in the same file arrangement they came in. As soon as the room was empty, large vacuum cleaners emerged from the wall and sucked up every crumb, every piece of debris. Then they sprayed the tables and floors with a liquid that smelled like disinfectant. The room was spotlessly clean again, ready for the next sad, depressing meal. Shall we go to the dormitories now? asked Sinhar and Nana Shamara. I nodded. We followed the children through one of the open doors and entered a place that was a combination of an old-fashioned orphanage and military barracks. It was a very large room but the ceiling was not high, only about 12 feet. Again, everything was beige and gray, and there were no windows to relieve the monotony. The room was full of beds arranged above each other in groups of three, like in a submarine. Dozens and dozens of such rows seemed to stretch to a very long distance. The beds were made of some metal, very smooth and of silver gray color. They seemed to be assembled like prefab furniture. Sinhar and Nana Shamara, I said, there are no ladders. How did the children reach the upper levels? They can levitate, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. Look at this. Part of each bed is magnetic, so each child can have his or her toys attached to it. As for the lower beds, the toys are stored next to them. So they have toys, I said. That's a mercy. Yes, the Greys discovered that mental stimulation is highly important to the hybrid's development. There are plenty of other activities, mostly with abductees, that relieve their lives of this tendum, at least to a certain extent. But they have no privacy at all. None whatsoever. They only get their own room when they are more mature. But they have one thing that pleases them. If the children want to, they can put their things in their bed, close the bed with a panel, and hide it inside a wall. They like that. I wonder, too, is it comfort for them to be together after all? Their feelings and emotional state are not exactly human. It's hard to explain. I think it's time for you to see them interact. Where are all the children now? They are attending various activities, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. Come, I'll show you. We entered a room that opened directly from the dormitory. To my surprise, it was really a glass bubble. You could see the outside, which was an unpleasant desert surrounding. I found it nasty, but I figured that to the children it might represent a pleasant change. About 10 children, seemingly between the ages of six and eight, sat on the ground, which was simply desert sand. They were playing with normal human toys, trucks, cars, and trains. They filled the things with sand using plastic trowels that one usually sees on the beach. They were also building tunnels from the sand, wetting it with water from large containers that stood here and there. They seemed to be enjoying their games, certainly concentrating on them, but their demeanor remained quiet and subdued and they did not engage in the laughter, screaming, yelling, or fighting that children of this age normally do. They also have rooms with climbing equipment and places to play ball, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. It is needed to strengthen their bones and muscles. I approached the children, a little apprehensively, worried that I might frighten the poor things. They looked up at me, seemingly waiting for me to do something but I was pleased to realize they were not afraid. I sat on the sand, took some stones that were scattered around, and arranged them so that they created a little road. 
The children stared at me for a minute with their strange, wise eyes, as if trying to read my thoughts and almost instantly gasped the idea and continued to build the road together. None of them smiled, but they seemed very much engaged in the new activity. Once all the stones were used, they looked at me again, as if trying to absorb information. And sure enough, after a minute, they took the trucks and made them travel down the little road. I got up and let them play. So they can read minds, I said to Sinhar and Nana Shamara. To an extent, she said, at this age, they basically just absorb images you project. You probably thought about the trucks going on the road and they saw it. And everything was done together as if they were mentally connected, I said. Do they do everything together? Yes. Everything is communal, even the bathrooms where they clean themselves. But don't be too upset about it. If they are separated from each other before adolescence, they become extremely upset. It is almost as if the onset of puberty makes them an individual, and before that, they have a group mentality. Horrible, I said. They are not unhappy, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. Only as adolescents, when they break off the communal mind, do they come to understand how unhappy they really are but we will visit the adolescents on another occasion. Very well, I said. Would you like to see the room where they keep the fetuses? Asked Sinhar and Nana Shamara. I followed Sinhar and Nana Shamara to the corridor and we walked quite a distance before opening another door. We entered another one of the hangar-sized rooms full of tanks. Each tank contains liquid nutrients, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. This is where they put the fetuses as soon as they are removed from the abductees. The tanks are arranged in order from the youngest fetus to those that are almost ready to be removed. Do they separate them into stages, I asked? Yes, this room is for early stagers only. In other rooms, they have the middle stagers but the late stagers remain in the mother's womb until birth to make them as close to humans as possible. And what are the babies like? Quiet, not as responsive as human babies. Many of them die as soon as they are removed from the tank. Those that survive are genetically and generally mentally well-developed, but physically weak and emotionally subdued. And who takes care of them? both the greys and the abductees. The greys perform most of the physical requirements, but the abductees supply the human touch. We can't go there yet. How come? We need to prepare you to interact with the abductees. They are very complicated. We shall have a few sessions about interacting with them at the same time when we teach you how to work with the adolescents. Also, you had wanted some instruction on how to contact and help those people that are children of humans and Anunnaki's like your son. That requires some teaching too. We went back to our spaceship, not saying much. And I remember thinking that if I were part of the Anunnaki council, I would vote to kill every gray in the known universe. Of course, I did not say it to Sinhar and Nana Shamara, but I'm sure she knew how I felt. Back home, I went to my beloved garden and sat under a tree that constantly showered tiny blossoms on me like little snowflakes. I did not even know I was crying. What is the matter, said Marduk, who suddenly appeared next to me. I told him about the visit with the hybrids. The hybrids are not abused, said Marduk. Something else is bothering you. I thought for a moment, and then I decided I might as well be honest with him. Yes, I said. I cannot understand the Anunnaki's casual attitude about the fact that thousands of human beings are tortured and killed all the same, all the time. Neither you nor Sinhar and Nana Shamara seem to be as shocked as I am about the fact that the Greys engage in such atrocities. Marduk was quiet for a minute, thinking. 
At this conversation, we did not use the conduit because in my agitated state, I found it difficult. I was not entirely used to it as of yet, so I waited for him to say what he thought. I see your point, he said. You think we are callous about it. Yes, I do, to tell you the truth. Why don't you destroy the grays? Why do you allow so much death, so much pain? Are you, after all, cruel beings? Have you become callous because you have lived so many lives and become thick-skinned about suffering? No, we are not cruel. It's just that we view life and death differently than you do. We cannot destroy all the grays even if we wanted to. We don't commit genocide even if they try to do it. We don't want to kill them. We know that they will die on their own. And in the meantime, suffering means nothing to you? It means a lot, but destroying the grays would not eliminate suffering that occurs in all the universes we go to. There are other species that are even worse than the grays. You just don't know about them because their horrific behavior is not aimed at humans. It seems to me that even though you are so much more sophisticated than humans, the fact that you deny the existence of God may have deprived you of your ethics after all. Deny God? What makes you think we deny God? asked Marduk. He seemed genuinely surprised. Marduk. You have told me more than once that the Anunnaki created the human race. Not God. So where is God if he is not the creator? Your statements are contradictory. Not at all, said Marduk. The Anunnaki view of God is similar to humans' religions in many ways, but contains much more information. The term we use to describe God is all that is to the Anunnaki. God is made of inexhaustible mental energy and contains all creation within itself, therefore representing a, everything that has existed, exists now, or will ever exist in the future. And that includes all beings, all known universes, and all events and phenomena. God's dearest wish is to share in all the lives of all that its creations learn and experience with them and from them. But while they are imperfect, God itself is perfect, which is why it can't only be seen as a gestalt. Why are you calling God it? I asked. Because we do not attribute gender to God. I see. I said, so in essence, the Anunnaki God is not all that different from ours. What else should I know? It is impossible, or it is possible, that other primary energy gestalts exist before God came into being and actually created it. If so, then the possibility exists that there are many gods all engaged in magnificent creativity within their own domains. We are not certain if that is so, but we do not dismiss this beautiful possibility, that it is vastly different from human thought, I said, meditating. But how does it tie in with life and death issues and with the fact that you have created us? The individuals that exist within God though part of God, have free will and self-determination. In life and in death, each is a part of God and also a complete and separate individual that will never lose its identity. The Anunnaki are indeed the creators of human beings, but since each Anunnaki is a part of God, there is no conflict in the idea of their creation of humanity. Creation is endless and ongoing, and human beings in their turn create as well. For example, great art, literature, and service to other people, animals, and the planet Earth, though they do not exactly create life itself. We are all part of the grand gestalt, and that makes all that is such an apt name for God. So how does that make the situation with the Gray's atrocities any better? 
It is because the lives that they take are not disappearing into a void. Each individual is eternal, and even if a child is killed, will go into other domains. I'm not saying that this justifies the Gray's atrocities. I am merely pointing out that even though these atrocities do exist, the individuals affected will have another chance. Yes, this does make a difference, and I can see how it would affect your thinking. But for me, after seeing what the greys do to the humans in their labs, it is still very disturbing. I can understand that, Victoria. It is not something you are accustomed to. Tell me, do you still want to do this mission? He asked this question in a very neutral way, obviously not wanting to influence my free will. Yes, more than ever, I said. Maybe I can do some good for these poor, sad children. I have a suggestion then, said Marduk. I don't see it as a long-term mission since you cannot change the ways of the greys from within. I think you will find it a springboard to other missions, as it is obvious to me that you have some thoughts on making the Anunnaki do something about the greys to force them to stop their experiments. Doing this mission will be extremely good as a learning experience, right from inside the Gray's base. As for contacting the people who are the children of humans and Anunnaki's, that will not take much of your time. There are very few of these around these days. How long do you think the mission will take me? Exactly nine months, said Marduk. I stared for a minute and then laughed. I see what you mean, Marduk. You think I should start our daughter, allow her to grow in the tube in the Anunnaki fashion, and while she is in the tube, concentrate on my mission. Then I should come back and spend the time with you and the baby before embarking on other missions. Doesn't it sound like a good plan? While the baby is in the tube, there is nothing you can do for her other than look at her as she grows. And you can easily do that with a monitor from Earth, right from the Gray's base. And we will talk every day, so if you have any concerns about her, I can take care of it. That is a wonderful idea, I said. I will have the orientation regarding the abductees and the adolescent hybrids, and of course the human Anunnaki people. And when I'm ready to go on my mission, I will first stop at the hospital and start the baby. This plan made me feel a little better, but I knew I must give the issue some more thought and perhaps further discussion. So when I went to see Sinhar and Nana Shamara the next day to arrange for the orientation, I brought up the subject with her and told her honestly how I felt. Yes, I do understand how you feel, Victoria, she said. Before we do any more work with the hybrid mission, I would like to give you a little background about our relationship to life and death. I would very much welcome it, I said. So let's start with the concept of an haya, said Sinhar and Anna Shamara. I have never heard the word mentioned, I said. This word, which is also used as ahaya and al alef hayat, could be the most important word in Anaka, our language as well as the written history of humanity, because it deals with several extremely important issues. These are the origin of humans on earth, how humans are connected to the Anunnaki, importance of water to humans and Anunnaki, the life of humans, proof that it was originally a woman who created man, Adam and the human race via her Anunnaki identity, the return of the Anunnaki to earth, humanity's hope and salvation, and a better future for all, our gifts to you as your ancestors and creators. Complicated concepts, I said. I will try to explain the whole concept as clearly as possible, because it is extremely difficult to find the proper and accurate word or words in terrestrial languages and vocabularies. Let's start with the word itself. The word an haya is composed of two parts. The first part is an or a, 
pronounced a, or alef, pronounced alef. It is the same letter in Anaka, Akkadian, Canaanite, Babylonian, Assyrian, Ugartic, Phoenician, Moabite, Salam, Samaritan, Lachish, Hebrew, Aramaic, Nabataean, Aramaic, Syriac, and Arabic. All these languages are derived from Anaka. Incidentally, the early Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet and Latin, and Cyrillic came from the Greek alphabet. The Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek scripts also came from the Phoenician. Arabic and most of the Indian scriptures came from the Aramaic. The entire Western world received the language from the Phoenicians, the descendants of the Anunnaki. Anyway, the An in Anaka means one of the following, beginning, the very first, the ultimate, the origin, water. On earth, the word became Aleph in Phoenician, Aramaic, Hebrew, Syriac, and Arabic. Aleph is the beginning of the alphabet in these languages. In Latin, it's A, and in Greek, it is Alpha. In Hebrew, the Aleph consists of two Yuds, pronounced Yod. One Yod is situated to the upper right and the other Yod to the lower left. Both Yods are joined by a diagonal Vav. They represent the higher water and the lower water, and between them the heaven. This mystic Kabbalistic interpretation was explained by Rabbi Isaac Luria. Water is extremely important in all the sacred scriptures, as well as in the vast literature and manuscripts of extraterrestrial and the Anunnaki. Water links humans to the Anunnaki. In the Babylonian account of creation, Tablet 1 illustrates Apsu, male, representing the primeval fresh water, and Tiamat, female, the primeval salt water. These two were the parents of the gods, Apsu and Tiamat, begat the La Mu, Lach Mu, and the La Hamu, Lach Hamau deities. In the Torah, the word water was mentioned on the first day of the creation of the world, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the water. The higher water is wet and warm and represents the closeness to Yahweh God, and it brings happiness to man. The lower water is cold and brings unhappiness because it separates us from Yahweh, and man feels lonely and abandoned. The Ten Commandments commence with one letter, Aleph, Anochi, I am your God, who has taken you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. The letter Aleph holds the secret of man, his, her creation, in the whole universe as explained in the Midrash. In Hebrew, the numeric value of Aleph is one, and the meaning is first, Adonai, leader, strength, ox, bull, thousand, teach. According to Jewish teachings, each Hebrew letter is a spiritual force and power by itself and comes directly from Yahweh. This force contains the raw material for the creation of the world and man. The word of God ranges from the Aleph to the Tav, which the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. In Revelation 1.8, Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. In John 1, 1 through 3, as the word became Jesus, the Lord Jesus is also the Aleph and the Tav as well as the Alpha and the Omega. In him exists all the forces and spiritual powers of the creation. Jesus is also connected to water, an essential substance for the purification of the body and the soul. 
which is why Christians develop baptism in water. In Islam, water is primordial and considered the major force of the creation of the universe. The prophet Muhammad said, as can be read in the Quran, wa kaha la kana lakum min al miai kuala chai in he, meaning, and we, Allah, have created for you from water, everything alive. The Islamic numeric value of Aleph and God is one. To the Anunnaki and many extraterrestrial civilizations, the An or Aleph represents the number one, also Nibiru, the constellation Orion, the star Aldebaran, and above all the female aspect of creation symbolized in an Anunnaki woman, Gebur, whom you know as the angel Gabriel on earth. The angel Gabriel was a woman, I asked, amazed. Unquestionably so, said Sinhar Inanna Shamara, smiling. How interesting, I said. But do go on. What about the second part of the word Anhayeya? The second part, namely the Hayeya part, means life, creation, humans, earth where the first human, which was a female, was created. In Arabic, Hebrew, Aramaic, Turkish, Syriac, and so many Eastern languages, the Anunnaki word Haya and Hayats mean the same thing, life. But the most striking part of our story is that the original name of Eve, the first woman, was not Eve, but Hawawa, derived directly from Hayaya. You see, Eve's name in the Bible is Hawawa, or Shavava. In the Quran, it is also Hawawa. And in every single Semitic and Akkadian script, Eve is called Hawawa or Hayat, meaning the giver of life, the source of the creation. Now, if we combine An with Hayaya or Hayat, we get these results. Beginning, the very first, the ultimate, the origin, water and life, creation, humans, earth. Where the first was created, woman, and the whole meaning becomes the origin of the creation, and the first thing or person who created the life of humans was a woman, or water. Amazingly enough, in Anaka, woman and water mean the same thing. Woman represents water according to the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Anunnaki tablets. As clearly written in the Babylonian Sumerian account of creation, tablet one. Well, no wonder then that God has no gender in the Anunnaki concept, I said. I found that very interesting when Marduk told me about all that is as the name of God. Yes, it all ties together rather nicely, even if it's a little complicated, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. A little? I laughed. I will have to think about this for a long time before I'm comfortable with the concepts. But it is fascinating. I would like, moreover, to understand a little better how the Anunnaki created the human race. Well, it happened around 65,000 BCE, said Sinhar and Nana Shamara. The Anunnaki at the time lived in the regions you now call Iraq known then as Mesopotamia, Sumar, and Babylon, and also Lebanon, known as Lubanon, Phoenicia, and Phoenicia. We taught your ancestors how to write, speak, play music, build temples, and navigate, as well as geometry, algebra, metallurgy, irrigation, and astronomy, among other arts. We had high hopes for this race, which we have created in our image, but the human race disappointed us almost from the beginning, for human beings were, and still are, cruel, violent, greedy, and ungrateful. 
so we gave up on you and left earth. The few remaining Anunnaki living in Iraq and Lebanon were killed by savage military legions from Greece, Turkey, and other nations of the region. The Anunnaki left Earth for good, or at least that was the plan at the time. Other extraterrestrial races came to Earth, but these celestial visitors were not friendly and considerate like the Anunnaki. The new extraterrestrials had a different plan for humanity and their agenda included abduction of women and children, animal mutilation, genetic experiments on human beings, creating a new hybrid race, etc. But you are still there, Sinhar and Nana Shamara, and you are still trying to help. Obviously, you you would not have projects such as you had with me if you had forgotten us. No, we did not totally forget you. We could not. After all, many of your women were married to Anunnaki and some of our women were married to humans. Ancient history, the Bible, Sumerian tablets, Babylonian scriptures, Phoenician tablets, and historical accounts from around the globe did record these events. You can find them almost intact in archaeological sites in Iraq and Lebanon as well as in museums, particularly in the British Museum, the Iraq Museum, and the Lebanese Museum. So how did you keep in touch with human civilization? Before leaving you, we activated in your cells the infinitesimally invisible multi-multi-microscopic gene of Anhayeya. Yes, this is how It is all interconnected. It was implanted in your organism and it became a vital component of your DNA. Humans are not yet aware of this, just as they were unaware of the existence of their DNA for thousands of years. As your medicine, science, and technology advance, you will be able to someday to discover that minuscule, invisible, undetectable, on Hayeya molecule, exactly as you have discovered your DNA. On Hayeya cannot be detected, yet it is in your laboratories. It is way beyond your reach and your comprehension, but it is extremely powerful because it is the very source of your existence. Through On Hayeya, we remained in touch with you. And even though you are not aware of it, It is linked directly to the conduit and to a myria, a monitor, mirror on Nibiru. Every single human being on the face of the earth is linked to the outer world of the Anunnaki through Anhayeya. And it is faster than the speed of light. It reaches the Anunnaki through Ba'abs, stargates. It travels the universe and reaches the myria of the Anunnaki through the conduit which was integrated into your genes and your cerebral cells by the Anunnaki some 65,000 years ago. The same conduit I have now? Yes, that same conduit. Of course, humans cannot use it since it was not activated like yours, but hopefully someday, but hopefully someday, they will be able to. And how did the Anunnaki receive the content of the conduit to allow them to watch over the humans? Through the Myria, which we created to function with the conduit and the Anhayeya, even though we felt that you do not deserve it, the Anunnaki have been watching you, monitoring your activities, listening to your voices, witnessing your wars, your brutality, your greed and indifference towards each other for centuries. We did not interfere, at least not very much. But from my experience, you are returning. Yes, we will because we fear two things that could not destroy earth. Excuse me, yes, we will because we fear two things that could destroy earth and annihilate the human race the dominion of the earth and the human race by the greys, and the destruction of human life and the planet earth at the hands of humans. 
the whole earth could blow up. Should this happen, the whole solar system would be destroyed. As we know already, should anything happen to the moon, the earth will cease to exist. Is there hope that we will change? There is always hope. We are trying to change you. The most delightful and comforting aspect of you is the hope for peace, a brighter future, and a better life that you can accomplish and reach when you discover how to use it without abusing it. Every one of you can do that. Even when people die, their an hayaya will always be there for them to use before they depart earth. It will never go away because it is a part of you. Without it, you couldn't exist. Just before you die, your brain activates it for you. Seconds before you die, your mind will project the reenactment of all the events and acts, good and bad, in your entire life, past, and zoom you right towards your next non-physical destination, where and when you judge yourself, your deeds, and your existence, and where you decide whether you wish to elevate yourself to a higher dimension or stay in the state of nothingness and loneliness, and for how long. Everything is up to the individual, so there is no death. Our minds live on forever. Indeed, there is no death. Your minds live on and make all the individual decisions about their future. What about reincarnation? Do we return to earth ever? No, you will not return to earth, nor will your soul migrate to another soul or another body. From the evidence we have garnered, we know and not just believe that there is no such thing. And why would you wish to return to earth anyway? Earth is the lowest sphere of existence for humans. Everything else is an improvement. It's good to know that you have not deserve it, deserted us, Sinhar and Nana Shamara. It makes me feel safer for myself and for humanity. My dear Victoria, you are now a full Anunnaki and you will never ever be alone, but I understand your attachment to your previous fellow humans. There is no reason to worry about them. Humans are always connected to the Anunnaki in this life and the next. And in the future, we planned a much closer communication. So please go on with your mission with a lighter heart. There is plenty of bright hope for everyone, even the hybrids, I dare to say. I went home feeling much better about life, the universe, and my mission. As a matter of fact, I began to look forward to it as a new adventure, and soon I will have a baby girl too. And this concludes the reading from pages 161 to 175. And we still have to page... Three hundred and forty-three. So we're at page 170, 176 will be our next reading. And we have till page 342, 43. Thank you, everyone.